Mazur is the Volkansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Harvard University, an internationally recognized scientist and researcher. He leads a vigorous research program in optical physics and supervises one of the largest research groups in the physics department at Harvard University. In addition to his work in optical physics, he's also interested in education, science policy, outreach, and the public perception. Let's get going. This is my first confession. When I started teaching at Harvard, which was in 1984, I was asked to teach the big introductory pre-med course. Decided simply in terms of the approach to teaching, without even thinking about it, I decided I was going to do what had been done to me, lecture. Of course, that ignores the fact that most of our students, and definitely if you teach a pre-med class, that's true, most students are not going to go on to a career in physics. And very quickly, the signals came back telling me, Eric, you're doing a splendid job. What are the traditional standards by which we assess teaching? Well, I can think of two. One, the dreaded end of semester questionnaire. For me, I got 4.5, 4.7 on a five point scale. The other metric is the exam, the assessment we use. So, in short, they liked me and what I was doing in front of the class, and two, they were able to solve problems that were complicated. Obviously, I was doing the right thing. Now, all along, there were signs that something was wrong. For example, some students would write in their, at the bottom of their end of semester evaluation, physics is boring. Even though they gave me a high rating, they would write that down. Or physics sucks. Anyway, so I basically decided to ignore all of these signs and, and, and you know, pay more attention to the end of semester evaluation and my students' performance. Until in 1990, after teaching six years, I read an article in the American Journal of Physics which presented a survey of students' conceptual understanding of Newtonian mechanics. So this conceptual survey called the FCI, or Force Concept Inventory, tests the understanding of these three laws of Newton. Now I'll give you an example of what turns out to be the hardest questions on the hardest question on this test. A heavy truck and a light car collide head-on. During the collision, the force exerted by the heavy truck on the light car is A, larger than that of the light car on the heavy truck. B, they're equal in magnitude to each other. C, the light car exerts a larger force on the heavy truck than the other way around. D, they're not exerting any force on each other. They are just in each other's way. <laughs> Now, you're chuckling about that. I think no physicist in his right mind could ever come up with such an answer. You know, and that's the, the irony, actually. When you know your, your material, it's really difficult to come up with good multiple choice questions because the thing you can write down immediately is the correct answer. But how do you come up with plausible wrong answers? Now, in spite of the fact that most students can recite Newton's third law, which says, the force exerted by A on B in an interaction is equal to that exerted by B on A. Now, I have no problem saying that. that. That law is also known as action is reaction. The majority of the students is convinced that the heavy truck exerts a larger force on the light car. I thought, this is high school stuff. It has nothing to do with what I do at Harvard with my pre-meds. After all, most of these pre-meds have taken AP physics and have gotten a five on that AP physics exam. But then I read on. And I noticed something really interesting that Hestonies had done. See, the way these questions are worded, they do not involve any jargon. I mean, there's words like force in there and acceleration and velocity. But regardless of your education, you will have some mental picture of what is meant by the word force or, or velocity acceleration. So that means you can use this test as a pretest at the beginning of a term and then repeat it at the end of the term to see what the effect is of instruction on changing people's conception of these concepts of force, velocity, and acceleration. And has showed that there's actually very little difference between the test taken at the end of the semester and at the beginning. <laughs> well, 
I was still not really convinced, but then he had actually given the test in so many different schools in California, New Mexico, Arizona, that he was able to divide his data, I think for about 5,000 students, into four different uh, um, groups. Because there were quite a few students whose instructor had won teaching awards. So he lumped all of those data together into the award-winning teacher category. Then there were a number of instructors who didn't like large lecture halls like this one, but did small group instruction, 20 students. So that was the small group instruction group. And then a third group where the instructor did a lot of hands-on demonstrations with the students. And a fourth group, which I thought was really interesting, which was a group where the instructor had scored absolutely at the bottom of the scale on this end of semester evaluation. So the dullest, driest, most boring teachers you can imagine. So those were the fourth groups. For each group, he averaged all the pretest scores and averaged all the post-test scores and determined the gain. So he could compare the gain across these four different categories. And you know what? No difference. No difference between the award-winning teacher and the teacher who scores extremely low on the end of semester scale. In other words, it doesn't make any difference what we do in front of the students. They learn next to nothing. <laughs> well, I felt challenged. You know, and I, my reaction, you can probably already predict this, not my students. Yeah. All of a sudden it became clear that in spite of high evaluations and in spite of good performance, my students were not really learning very much. So what I'd like but today, I want to get one message across to you, and that is that we should, really, we should really shift the focus from teaching to helping students learn. And I'll do that into, in three parts. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about education. What is education? We always take that word for granted. We have discussions about education assuming we all know what we mean. And then I want to talk about what I did in response to uh, this the rather disheartening discovery. I'll show you the data in just a, a second, which I call peer instruction. And um, then I'll show you data. I want to tell you a, a quote that I heard recently from Lee Schulman, former president of the Carnegie Foundation, who said, the plural of anecdotes is not data. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start by talking about education. Step into any classroom, including actually this one here right now, and you're likely to see a scene similar to the one shown in the back there. Which This is called a lecture, and um, it's a model that has been used, I guess, since the Greek invented the amphitheater. I would say it's a transfer of information. Right? It's the instructor in front there transferring information to the students. And then you could ask yourself, is education just a transfer of information? I would argue no, and I'm going to actually show you that it's not just a transfer of information. It's much more than that. So the students liked my notes because they were much more compact than the chapter in, in Halliday and Resnick. But after about six weeks, some students came to me and they said, Professor Mazur, couldn't we get a copy of your lecture notes at the beginning of each class period? This way we don't have to write down that much. And I had indeed noticed that every time I pen went A on the overhead or on the blackboard, 150 went, pens went A in the notebooks of the students. Somebody once told me that the lecture method is a process whereby the lecture notes of the instructor get transferred to the notebooks of the students without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's precisely what was happening in my class. I was taking 10 hours to take the information out of, uh, out of uh, Widener and Cells, turning it into my lecture notes. In class, I was either projecting it or putting it on a blackboard. The students were copying it into their notebooks. But the place where the information really needed to get, their brains, didn't get, as I will show you with the data that I'm going to project in a little bit. And then in the next year that I had to teach that same course, I said to myself, you know what? Rather than issuing these notes piecemeal, one lecture at a time, I'm going to send the whole collected set of lecture notes out for duplication the week before classes start. And on the first day of class, I gave every student the notes for the entire semester. You know what the unexpected result was? The unexpected result was that about half a dozen students wrote in their evaluations at the end of the year, Professor Mazur is lecturing straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> Hello? 
<laughs> what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes that was different from the lecture notes that I handed out? I was livid. But you know, the students had a point. I was lecturing for my lecture notes. So at least until the Industrial Revolution, second half of the 19th century or so, this way of teaching was the only way of teaching because it was the only way of transferring information from one generation to the next. So I would argue there's much more that needs to happen than just delivering information. And the fact that delivering information was not enough became clear when I gave this FCI. What is it that needs to happen? I'm going to show you the data in just a second. What needs to happen is that the student needs to make sense of the information, build mental models, not just remembering facts, but try to understand it and build mental models that you can use in other contexts. So in its traditional approach to teaching, we put all the emphasis on the easy part, the transfer of information. We leave the hard part, because I think we would all pretty quickly agree that the second part, assimilating is the hard part, we leave that to the student on his or her own. Imagine you've heard nothing of bad things about physics. You see this box that says problem solving strategy. That's your key to success, right? So you pull out your yellow highlighter. You highlight an entire section. It's been already highlighted by the publisher, but you highlight it anyway. <laughs> And you memorize the recipe. And now comes problem number one of your homework. Here's the recipe, there's the problem. And you apply the recipe to the problem, and it works. Why? Because a lot of the problems in the textbook are designed to match the recipe. And you think, whoa, this is great. Maybe physics is not that bad after all. And then you apply it to problem number two, and it works again. And then you apply it to number three, and it works again. You know, I told you in the beginning that some students told me that physics was boring and I could never imagine it. But imagine that it's been reduced to applying recipes, recipes you do not understand, as you can see from the data, blindly. And, and I say, yeah, that's right. Science is, I mean, physics then becomes very boring because there is no mental exercise other than following a recipe that is involved. And then comes problem number four. Here's the recipe. There's the problem, and you try, and you try, and it doesn't work. Why? Because as we all know, not all problems can be solved by, by recipes. Now imagine you're a student who has been misled to believe that there is such a thing as a recipe-based approach to solving problems. But then you discover on your first homework set that the recipe only works 75% of the time. This is madness, right? I mean, why would a professor teach you something that only works 75% of the time? And you don't understand why it works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. I can imagine getting frustrated. So frustration, boredom, is very likely to happen in that large group in my class. So what should we do? That was when I finally started asking myself, what should I do? So I really didn't know what to do anymore, because still they could not articulate a coherent question. So, but I knew that about 40% of the students had given the right answer on this question on the FCI. So I, in a, I don't exactly know what got to me, but I said, why don't you turn to your neighbor and start discussing it with your neighbor? And the whole classroom erupted in chaos. I'd never seen that. You know, I would usually I would lecture, and then I would stop and say, does anybody have a question? Anybody? And you wait. Students look down because they don't want to, they don't want to, no eye contact, that's right. And then if you wait long enough, it's always the same person in the front row reluctantly raises his or her hand. It's like pulling teeth. But here, everybody started. They forgot about me in front of the classroom. And what happened was that the students who had the right answer pretty quickly convinced those who did not have the right answer. And, and you know, there's a certain irony to that. What I found out was if you have two students sitting next to each other, let's say John and Mary. Mary has the right answer for the right reason. John does not have the right answer because he doesn't understand it yet. Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply force of logic. But what I realized was that Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class there. Why? Because Professor Mazur learned this such a long time ago, he has no clue anymore about the difficulties that, that are going on in John's mind. Right? The better you know something, the more difficult it becomes to teach because you're no longer aware of the conceptual difficulties of a beginning learner. Whereas Mary has only recently learned it and still has a pretty good idea of what John is struggling with. So it's ironic. The better you know something, the more difficult it becomes to teach. 
So I thought maybe we can, maybe we can leverage this in the classroom. And again, if you think about education as being a two-step process, one, transfer of information, two, assimilating the information, let's make ourselves as faculty members available to help students with the assimilation. And let's give them more responsibility for gathering the information. After all, information is everywhere now, right? So the basic process is this. I give students a reading assignment. In the sciences, that's pretty much heresy, but they have to read the notes before coming to class. I am not going to lecture on the notes anymore. And then in class, what matters is not coverage, because it's the reading that determines the coverage, but it's depth. Let's go into depths in the areas that are difficult. And I do that not by telling, but by teaching, semi-Socratically, like Socrates already said 2,000 years ago, we should teach by questioning, not by telling. So there are two, there are two features to this. One is it has active engagement. It's impossible to sleep through class because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. <laughs> Believe it or not, some students complain about that. <laughs> the second thing is there's continuous information flow, not just from, this, from me to the students, but back. What about problem solving? And you know, I was a little bit worried about that initially because I thought I have, I decided that I was not going to do any problem solving in class anymore. I, I, yeah. Years before, I would always have done on the board a couple of problems as example problems for the students. But in 1991, I decided you don't derive benefit from seeing a physicist solve problems, just as you don't derive much benefit. Suppose you want to, to learn to play the piano. You don't put up CDs of Murray Pariah playing Chopin sonatas to, 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 to learn piano playing. You have to play the piano. When you want to train for a marathon, you don't sit on the couch eating popcorn watching DVD tapes of, of marathon runners. You have to do the running. If you want to learn problem solving, you've got to do the problem solving. You don't learn by watching somebody else do it. So what does this mean? This means that better understanding leads to better problem solving. Uh, makes sense in hindsight, right? But, and this is the most important message I want to leave you with, the converse of this statement is not true. Good problem solving does not necessarily mean understanding. I want to leave you with this summary. I think that the traditional indicators of success, end of semester evaluations, student exam performance, are very misleading indicators. And that education really is no longer about information. It's about how to use information. And again, the traditional approach puts all of the emphasis on information, not on how to use the uh, information.